Good evening, everyone. How are we all? Good. All well. Nice to see you again. Uh, welcome to the February ABA meeting. Do we have any new people here tonight? Wow. That's a lot. So, welcome. Uh, first of all, <laughs> such a well oiled system. Um, um, so, as you may have seen, we started the, the sign in this month, so we'll just keep doing that each month. Um, the toilets are down the hallway for, and all the way to the end for those that are new. Uh, the Google group is, uh, you can speak to Simone about it, but you, essentially you give your email over and when we publish content or updates to that, you'll get it as an email notification. Um, we do have some merchandise. The hats are great, actually. I wear mine all the time. Um, those are free pens over there too if you need one. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're going to go through the normal, uh, the normal lay of the land, um, latest charging, EV, uh, charging infrastructure. Um, there has been a few little bits and pieces um, since the January one, but uh, I thought I might actually pad this out a little bit just so everyone's aware of what is available. Um, so each one of these dots are a DC 50 kilowatt fast charger. Um, this one here is a Type 1 at Yarra Bilba, uh, so just be careful of that if you're a Type 2 owner. Um, but yeah, this cluster here, along with the Tesla supercharger that's in the city there, is actually the densest uh, grouping of DC fast chargers in Australia. So um, I think that's, we're quite privileged to have like that sort of available amount of DC chargers. Um, the one there in uh, Morton Bay opposite uh, Bribe, where's that? Up the top. This one? Oh, you didn't write. Thank you. Yeah, it's the EV Network's um, 350 kilowatt charger up there. The, is everyone familiar with the electric superhighway, Queensland Government uh, oh. initiative to put charges from the Gold Coast to Cairns? Well, they rolled that out in 2018, and well, they started in 2018, and um, each one of these is a 50 kilowatt um, all the way up. Um, there's a list, I won't read them all out, but there's a list of the ones um, if you want to go on a trip up the coast. But why I mention this is because they're, before the middle of this year, they're gonna roll out the, the second phase. So the tender's gone out, and um, that's actually closed now. So I would believe that um, they will actually start building these sites in the not too distant future. There was a, an announcement that, um, oh, this is, this is the south side. So we've got, um, no, that's all right. Um, so we're gonna have another one at Ipswich at Forest Glen. Um, so you've got the Eve, the one you just had the question about, that's just here. And then you've got Karoi just there. So. Um, pretty handy for those um, needing to charge to the Sunshine Coast. Uh, it's actually on the south, coming back south uh, near the pie shop and that. Well, that's, it's actually on Plugshare and it's not actually announced, it's leaked. That's why it's leaked on there. So someone has gone onto Plugshare and updated the, um, the app to show that they're putting one of the Quest sites there, but it hasn't actually been announced yet. And as you can see on here, I've written anticipated, that's because they're not announced, okay? So don't go writing to your minister that um, JD told you that there was a site going in there because this is why they don't announce ahead of time is because um, I have it from an inside source that they announced Helen's Vale and they didn't actually um, get to build that one due to the Q Rail changing the car park and the Commonwealth Games and it got delayed and they just had this person that was just badgering them with ministerial complaints about them. You said you were gonna build one here and you haven't, so um, these are just anticipated ones to be done by the middle of the year. 
Um, this is, uh, so the last, that last graphic finished around about Gladstone just here. Um, so you can see there's quite a few, um, but we're filling in some of the bigger stops. Um, I believe this is Bowen just here, and that was a bit temperamental, that one, for uh, people that, uh, and, and the distance between here and there was not ideal that people could really avoid stopping at, like not stopping at that charger. So when it played up, um, you know, it wasn't very good, it wasn't a good look. So having these charges in every 100 kilometres is fantastic, actually, if you want to go and uh, travel north. Obviously, this is the Queensland government doing this north, but there are the uh, Charge Fox EV networks, NRMA, that are building them south. So uh, this is just a recap of the north, the ones on the Queensland Electric Superhighway. And Port Douglas, actually. So that's um, it's actually going to go further than Cairns. So just quickly, um, Ingham and Proserpine were announced. So much to the surprise of some of the people in the question management. Also, they've just announced that they can be charging 20 cents until an hour. Yeah, I'm going to get to that. So um, these, this is just a, um, a rundown of the pricing of each of the charges as it sits at the moment, mostly for the Brisbane region. So we have the, the Cooch and Creek site 35 cents a kilowatt hour, 25 cents a minute, okay? If you have uh, an IMEV or a 24 kilowatt hour LEAF, you're gonna be paying nearly about a dollar a kilowatt hour, um, so that's not that economic. But if you have a Tesla Model 3 performance, then you're paying around about 40 cents a kilowatt hour because your charging speed's so high that you're out, of, you, you, it's gone, done, and you're out of there. So that's the model that they were always looking for. Um, that's the relevance of their charges, um, that's how they've set their pricing. Uh, we have this at uh, Turnbull, just down the road here. So it's the Charge Fox, so the specific Charge Fox charges, uh, the two 350s and the 50 kilowatt up on the roof. Uh, different to the Queensland Electric Super Highway, where they are also Charge Fox, but you only for really for finance to pay, only for payment purposes, if that makes sense. Um, so these are the actual Charge Fox 350 kilowatts, um, and they're 40 cents a kilowatt hour. So that would probably, if you're traveling to the coast and back or whatever, they're probably a good option if you want a really fast charge. Don't they still have the uh, free charge inside the terminal? Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I, I, I'm specifically just going to discuss the DC fast charging here because there is AC everywhere and I couldn't possibly go through every site. So um, underneath there is uh, an EV link, 22 kilowatt um, uh, type one cable, um, but you can bring your own type two to type two if you've got a type two car. Uh, and there's three te Tesla chargers that are Tesla specific only, they don't have legacy mode turned on or whatever. Um, so Turnbull's actually a really good site. It's got a lot of charging um, for all different models. Uh, so of any of you that do DC fast charging, you may recognize this site. It's out at Hamilton. So this, was the, this is the closest Queensland electric superhighway charger. Um, two, 250 kilowatts and the EV link 22 AC over there. Um, just as uh, it was mentioned, have, they've just turned on the pricing, 20 cents a kilowatt hour. Now, that's a fantastic price when nearly every one of us would pay more than that at home for electricity. So um, there's no real reason why you shouldn't go there and, and charge up. Probably even, might even save you a little bit of money and time. So, next one. Uh, this is one that uh, is very recent. It's under the Queensland University of Technology under the stadium at Kelvin Grove. Um, now, it's a free charger, but it's got boom gates for the car park. So if you want to pay $5 for an hour, to, you can go in there and, and charge up. So that ends up being a few bucks cheaper than going and paying at Hamilton for the 20 cents a kilowatt hour, depending on your battery size. On, we on weekends, it's also 
um, five dollars for weekends. So <laughs> if you don't have one hour, or like you don't want to pay ten dollars or whatever, if you want to maximise your economy, then you can go on a weekend, and it's if it's available, it's only five dollars for two hours or three hours, however long you want to be there. Uh, and lastly, the University of Queensland has this at St Lucia. It's a free charger still, and it's a 50 kilowatt. And it's got the Tesla one just here on the post. Um, so as far as I'm aware, that's the cheapest available one at the moment. I don't think there are any other free 50 kilowatts at the moment. St. Lucia campus at... You can look on PlugShare. We can look up. It's... You got me. I don't know. I don't... Essentially... I think it's Chanel, so Fred's Chanel Drive. And then you turn on to... I don't know the road names, but then it's... There's a car park, and then it's just at the back of the car park. Um, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I'm not really that familiar with St. Lucia campus myself. It's on the other side of my town for me, but... Your plug share should go into straight to it. Yeah, it, it, plug share pinpoints are exactly where the charges are, so it's a fantastic app if you want to work that out. You've just got to go under the building. Yeah, you've got to go underneath the car park and out the... or under the building and out the... I think it's your first turn after the... Turn where you turn rooks, uh, yeah. right to go back up the, no, up the hill to the university. No one knows the name of the street. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> right, now, next one. Can we go to the second? This is the last one. This one. Yeah. 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 Um, so that's EV, latest DC fast charging availability. Um, Last month I just had a list of these, but I thought it might be uh, wise to show you the actual cars this month. Um, and these are the cars that are coming out this year that have been announced. Um, so the Mercedes EQC has won the wheels car of the year, which gets a few laughs because um, I think I mean, I spoke about it on social media and, and stuff, but it doesn't really equate very well, in my opinion, to... It to <laughs> yeah, it, anyway, look, let's, let's not worry about that too much, but essentially it's 140,000. You're going to have 280 to 350 kilometres range. Um, it does have a fast charging speed, 110. That's pretty good. Uh, consumption's around about 25 kilowatt hours per 100. And it's um, in 35 minutes, you're going to put in 224 kilometres on a fast charger. Uh, the MG ZS EV. Uh, this is a entry level EV. It's approximately 48,000. Um, they had an introductory price around about 47,990 or something like that. Um, they haven't really announced the price that it's going to be in the future, um, but it has a smaller battery, 44.5 kilowatt usable. Um, consumption around about 17. Um, because these cars aren't here, I've had to sort of do some research as to what the consumption is based on um, a few different sources because you can't always go on what it is in England or other cold countries because they tend to lowball the the, the, the range and, and consumption tends to be a bit higher because of the weather. Um, when do but, they think that'll be available in Australia? Yeah, well, this one is um, quarter three, sorry. So each slide, it's going to tell you up the top, uh, quarter three. Um, so after, after June. So, but at, each month I will update you as soon as the information is available. Um, so realistically, um, it's got an 80 kilowatt uh, onboard charger, which is even faster than the Kona, but it, um, I, I haven't seen the charge curve yet, but the, you're putting in around about 180 kilometers in 36 minutes, which is okay. Um, but yeah, nothing's really comparing to the speeds we can see in some of the other EVs at the moment. So. Um, Audi e-tron, if you've got 130,000, 
um, quarter three of this year. Um, so in, instead of telling you every time that they're coming out, none of these are available now until after the middle of the year. Okay, they're all middle of the year onwards. Um, there was only the Mercedes that was coming out, like it's actually coming out. So uh, 21 kilowatt hours per 100, 155 kilowatt hour charging speed, and that's a very fast charging curve, I have seen it. It's very fast and flat, and then it drops off up, at, up in the high percentage, which means that even though it has higher consumption, because of your charging speed being so high, you're able to, you know, um, get back on the road. It's, it almost negates your consumption in a way. Uh, the Porsche Taycan, we mentioned this last month, um, $300,000 ex expected price, 270 kilowatt charging speed, just absolutely ridiculous, you know. Um, so 280 kilometres can be put in in 21 minutes, right? So that's 15 kilometres a minute. So that's pretty decent. Okay. Well, that's the best there is actually. So Tesla can't match that at the moment, or, like or don't haven't matched that uh, with their. I think they can make they can make 250 on their version three Tesla superchargers over in the United States with the Model 3s, but. Um, are there any, do you know if there are any model, if there are any version three superchargers in Australia at the moment? You haven't heard of any? Yeah, I don't think they're here yet, but um, yeah. That's winning the race, but yeah, obviously you pay a price. And it's been, it's had a bit of a bad rap because everyone is comparing it to Tesla and you're paying twice the price of a Model S or something like that, but um, I think the consumption is actually a bit better than what, the, what some of the reports are. You don't have to flog it around every single corner, do you know what I mean? Which is probably what they do in the test drives, you know, I would be. <laughs> oh, Bill Gates didn't buy a hydrogen um, ship either, by the way. You can't believe everything you read in the media. Um, the Volvo XC40. 90 to 100,000 coming after the middle of the year, 75 kilowatt usable, 400 kilometres of range. No real consumption figures I know about that one. Not a bad looking thing though. No, that's right. Uh, Mini Cooper SE, the price once again, um, I've guessed that price it could be even a little bit lower. I just don't see them trying to loot, like not to try and go underneath the cars that are the cheapest, like the MG. When, well, why would you just offer it for 40,000 when you can bump it up to 46? So that's my opinion, but we'll see, we'll see. Um, small battery, small range. Pretty much a car that from 2017, an EV from 2017 really, like, but you'll be buying it new. Uh, the Polestar 2, 100,000, coming at the end of the year, 75 kilowatt hour usable. Good efficiency, so this one got 500 kilometer range. Looks nice too. I like the look of that one. Sorry, who's bringing bring that out? Polestar. Polestar is the brand. Two is the model. They had a Polestar one, and now it's Polestar two. I think um, I think Volvo owns that. That Didi or some Didi or someone else owns that. Essentially, somehow they're always Chinese. Fully owned Chinese at the top. Uh, and uh, the EVA E3 might be, you might have seen this also advertised as the Glory E3. Um, I spoke with Peter, at, uh, I caught up with him uh, last week, who's the manager of this brand, and he said it's coming out in quarter four. They're still uh, reconfiguring it, but as I mentioned last month, it um, seems like quite a nice car. So, wait to hear more on that one. Uh, recent events, uh, it's been a pretty busy month. Uh, I did the silent, the silent highway uh, EV event was a Tesla group um, event that I sort of tagged into as well. They drove from Narang to Maroochydore, but that's when the rain started and it actually blocked the road at Coomera. So um, we spent hours waiting up at Myrie Field for them to turn up. 
um, only for them to then want to have lunch. <laughs> That's all right, I was ready to go, but anyway. Um, so that was fine. Uh, wasn't too bad. There was about 15 to 20 cars on that one. Uh, EV information day, courts. So, do you know much about that one? Um, yeah, so I think he reckoned about 100 people turned up, and he had quite a number of people that he got email addresses for. Um, but yeah, it was really just starting because they wanted to start an EV group. Other than that, I don't know if you've been. No, I, potentially there may be in the not too distant future some Queensland sub branches in some more of the, the Cairns, Townsville, or rocky areas, Toowoomba, maybe. Um, we're just flushing that out at the moment. So, uh, but the, essentially, they had a day up there at one of the resorts, and 100 people came. So that was good. Yeah, lots um, of uh, quite a few people here went to the Bayside EV cruise that I organised. Um, I think everyone pretty much had fun, uh, as there was so much, uh, as there were so many people here that went. I won't harp on about that one, but essentially, um, we left at Carindale. I didn't tell people where they were going. They just had clues to follow, and then we went to Wellington Point um, Reserve. We met there, and we drove. We were meant to drive down as a group to Victoria Point. Um, I waited for stragglers, so I think the majority of people went down there. And then at the end point, I had the Emotions guys with their scooters, and my wife cooked a barbecue. So uh, that was pretty good fun. Uh, Brisbane EV catch up was just uh, something that I want to start on a you know a semi regular basis where we just meet um, at a location just for a catch up and coffee because what I kind of came away from the EV cruise is that I'm I'm spending a bulk amount of time organising an EV cruise only to like well the part I also enjoy is like the socialising event part of it not necessarily cruising with all the other guys, it's like meeting people and talking about their EVs. So I just thought um, for a lot less effort I could just organise a place to meet and then we could just go there and meet up. So um, if you guys would like to join me on the next one I'll put it on um, social media. I'll... <laughs> got to be pretty loud to be louder than me really. Is that electric? No. Electric brakes? <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll put it on the Google group, I'll put it on social media, so whatever platform you're, you guys are used to. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll just meet up somewhere. I'll try and organise it so... Um, unfortunately, the one we went to at Turnbull, there was a lightning storm, so there was about seven or eight cars there. and. I still got to cook, catch up with a few people, so that was good. Um, but the next one, hopefully, it won't be rained out. Uh, Premier's Business Series Electric Vehicle Forum, we, uh, Graham, Gary and I went to on Tuesday. And it was very, essentially, it was a bunch of three or four important uh, people, including the Minister um, and Mark Bailey, isn't it? Yeah, I'm not that great with names. Um, but yeah, they had uh, a few people there that are experts in their field and they did some presentations about the future. Uh, and yeah, essentially, um, I actually recorded it on my phone. Um, I've just got to work out, if anyone would like to listen to it, because it's actually worth listening to, if anyone would like listening to it, I've got to work out how to podcast it or something like that, so. Good question? <laughs> yeah, you can hit me up later and tell me how to do that. I'll do it. Uh, next one. Uh, future events. So this is a list um, as much as I can be uh, giving you as much information ahead of time just so you can go to any EV events you'd like. But um, the, I think Jan mentioned uh, that she would like to attend the MCAC Cars and Coffee down at, uh, where is it, eight, um, mile eight Mile, yeah, Logan Road, Eight Mile Plains. Uh, they've got a facility there. Uh, when I went there last year, you have to drive, once you get into the facility, you have to drive all the way to the end and they're, they're building's down there. Um, 
these are some future dates, actually, if, you're, um, if you find that uh, interesting. The Enviro Tech Day GIMPI is coming up in April, uh, showcasing technologies to reduce energy emissions, wastewater, water cost to business and households. Future events, um, nothing too close at the moment. I'll be organising a, a longer range drive to Byron. Um, the Noosa EV Expo is going to be August. Uh, the committee is working on the Brisbane Drive EV Week. That's how, it, I think that's what it's called, isn't it? Um, that's going to be first week of September, most likely. And we've got the National AEVA Expo, 9th, 10th and 11th of October down in Melbourne. Um, so just a few other little bits and pieces and I'll, um, I will speak to uh, some owners that want to give updates on their projects. But uh, from the national body is actually working away in the background to improve the AEVA and um, since we had the AGM in Sydney, uh, they came up with like a mission statement and um, they've, they've drafted all that type of stuff. They've um, agreed to focus on um, improving the website, which I've heard has been coming for a long time, but I have actually been on the website, the new one, and it seems to be an improvement. Um, it, but what's important that it should be easier for the members to join up, which is um, an antiquated system at the moment. Um, and we'll go to the next slide, which is the EV sales. Don't know where the hell this, the camera's going to pick this up, but the important column is 2019 here. So um, all battery electric vehicles went from 1,029 to 5,272 last year. So I think that's um, a sign that there's a little bit of a creep up. Um, I am uh, a big subscriber to Tony Sebo, uh, one of the professors from overseas, and he said, you know, S-curves can go dramatically straight up. So it, it's not going to take too many more consecutive years before we start to see maybe a vertical rise. Okay, so um, if that's 10,000 in 2020, well, you know, we know the S curve's well on the way to full adoption, you know. So. Have you had any use of any like commercial electric vehicles coming in? Like no, this is. Um, I mean, I've seen what's in the news and uh, that type of stuff, but this is primarily uh, the the data for passenger vehicles and light commercials, is my understanding. They're usually clumped in into the one group, uh, but as you can see, I mean. How many models would there really be available to us right now? There's probably 10-ish, maybe less. And the slides that I just went through before showing like nearly 10 coming out this year, all right? So as more and more models come onto the market, it puts pressure, downward pressure on the, the price. And in five years time, we're gonna start to see, you know, stronger uptake, lower prices, and then you know, it'll just kick on from there. So, uh, this is the plug-in hybrids, uh, and the total went from eight, including plug-in hybrids, went from eight thousand seven hundred to fifteen thousand four hundred. So, almost a double there. So that's pretty good. All right. Uh, I know Francesco wants to. Um, is it Francesco or Francisco? Yeah, Francisco. Francisco would like to chat about his uh, what he's doing with his Pajero, um, and for any of you that haven't that aren't on the forums, he was driving it around. Didn't have an engine in the engine bay. <laughs> it was pretty hilarious, actually. Um, but do you want to come up now? Um, yeah. um, I'm just not exactly sure what I'm going to say. Okay. Say whatever you like. <laughs> Um, tell us when you started, tell us... I can't remember when I started. <laughs> um, what are you working on? Well, what I'm working on now is trying to get the, the Invera and the BMS um, working. Uh, there's a battery... Yep. Oh. Sorry? Um, 
Um, been trying to get the BMS and the um, um, and the inverter to work. Um, so um, I've built the gate drive that drives the transistors, and I've put the motor uh, with gearbox into the car so that I could test it that make, to make sure that mechanically it doesn't fall apart. And I was going to use a friend's um, inverter that he's been developing uh, to drive the the, the the logic for the transistors. But uh, he's, got, uh, he's got some bugs and it doesn't quite work properly. Like it drives, it has more torque in, the, in one direction than in the other direction. So um, he reckons that it's not a bug, but I think it's actually a bug. He thinks that it might be something wrong with the motor, but I don't really see how the motor can do that. So, um, so what have you brought in tonight? Well, the, there's a battery, um, you know, a battery a uh, bit of a battery. Just watch the, the back because the just make sure that you don't short out the two the two ends. Um, so this is uh, what I'm using at the moment for testing. Um, so that's roughly how it's going to be in the car, except that um, it's going to have more more cells. So the one that goes in the car has got five in line, which is about nearly the full length of the car. So about 1.7 meters long. So just um, a quick explanation for those that are completely unfamiliar. These are the battery pouches in, in between here, uh, the little silver packets, suit packets. And uh, these pipes are the cooling pipes. Um, and uh, Francisco is working on a manifold to run the cooling and all that type of stuff. Yeah, so the, um, <clears throat> the cooling pipes actually form the structure that holds the battery together as well. So it's reasonably light. Uh, from the point of view that you don't actually have to have any extra structure to hold the, the battery. So the cooling acts as, a, you know, as the, the structure that holds everything. Um, How many kilowatt hours are you going to put in the um, battery? Uh, 70. The, the one for the car is going to be 70. That one is 3. Um, just watch out and make sure that you don't short the, uh, the two ends. Yeah, because it doesn't have a fuse. Well, um, sounds like a design flaw. Well, that's actually the <laughs> testing one. No, I've been, I basically, that's just for me testing the, the BMS to make sure that it, um, that it reads everything. That, um, anyway, yeah, that might be a good idea. Um, so that's just to test that the BMS works. So it reads the voltages, it communicates with the rest, and it does the bypass. Um, I've put a... Um, a DC to DC converter for the bypass, which I'm starting to think that maybe wasn't really necessary. So you can bypass about four amps without getting warm, um, but um, maybe it doesn't need to bypass that much. And because it recycles the energy, so instead of dissipating it into a resistor, which is what most of them do, uh, what this does is it pumps the energy back into the pack. So you can balance as you charge or as you discharge. So for example, if your cells are According to the manufacturer, the cells are within 3%, um, which means that um, if you use the conventional uh, bypass, you can never really get uh, everything out of each cell. So you, once the weakest cell gets to, to the limit, then the other ones that could be 3% more, more capacity are still not going to give you any more. With this, you can basically get exactly the maximum out of each, uh, out of each cell. Uh, whether it's really worth the trouble, you know, I'm not very sure. <laughs> When you're getting 500 kilometers range, it'll be worth more? Well, you know, it's probably 3%, um, maximum 3%. I mean, all the bypasses can, can bypass about, I think, about 2 kilowatts um, equivalent. If you, know, if you turn all of them on at the same time, it will, it will be able to bypass about 2 kilowatts, uh, which is quite a lot. Now, it will be able to balance the cells very quickly. But um, you know, from what I've been uh, finding out, you only balance them once, and then after that, apparently they stay fairly, fairly, fairly good. So, what's next on your project then? Um, the next thing is um, uh, I need to make sure that all that works correctly. So I've got to run it for a while uh, because because the BMS goes inside the battery. Then once I've assembled the battery, if one of them fails, then it's basically I need to pull the whole thing apart, which is not that not that simple. Um, so I've got to have that running for a while, balancing and, and doing all that. The other thing that I'm doing is um, getting the gate drives and all that tested more thoroughly. Uh, and probably we'll start working on the inverter. So that, that's be the, that'll be the bit that drives the, the gate drive. 
um, if anybody wants to spend some time playing with the, you know, with the, with the demo board of uh, one of the processes that I'm going to use, you're welcome to uh, play with it. Um, if I can get some help on, on sorting it out, mostly um, reading up the data sheets on how all, how all the D2As and all of those bit work, then that would probably make it a lot quicker. You know, the, the software is not that difficult. Um, it's just uh, going through all the uh, finding out how to, what registers to set to make sure that your PWMs come out in the right pins and all that sort of stuff. And you are at Strathmore, aren't you? Yeah. If anyone is on the north side interested in help, perhaps um, speak to Francisco after. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, so that's about it. Okay. Um, there's a video of it in YouTube, but um, yeah. I'm not sure if you can get to it. Yeah. Um, well, you can. Uh, it's on the website, on the, yeah. on the forum. Do you know how to drive? Uh, uh, okay. You, you, can, you drive that while we chat. Uh, is there any other EV uh, builders that want to give us a progress on their EV? No? Okay. Um, well, your. We get Mitch from DC World uh, Electrical. He's made a he's made a charge box for the group. Okay. Mitch. <laughs> Mitch, you've been thrown under the bus. Get up here. So no one, just pretend like no one knows anything about what you're about to say. Oh, okay. Um, basically, uh, DC Electrical was corporate sponsor for these guys. Um, we're finally getting in the swing of getting some stuff together. It's taken a little bit of time. Um, we're in the process of decking out one of our utes with the logos and I'll chat to you about later about putting a logo across the back because we would like to go to the events as well and support you guys. Um, so essentially what I've done is I've built a portable charging box that can do six vehicles at once. Um, so you're talking the top three units, uh, 15 amps each. So your 15 amp plugs that you carry around typically in the back of the car, you can do three of those. And then three 10 amp charging ports as well out of the same box. And then you can close the box, lock it while you go inside and chow down at the restaurant or in the shops, whatever you guys are doing, yeah, we won't have lunch. That's a three phase plug. So basically any sports ground, most shopping centers have an access plug. It'll just be a matter of us getting permission to use it because normally they switch them off with the breaker. So, but if we're gonna bring in, you know, 40, 50 cars, can't see it being a problem. So it's an event solution. So it's pretty much an event solution. Um, we're sort of just working out how you guys will end up using it because we would like for you to use it for your advertising and get sponsors to sponsor it for you. So you can have a, you know events sponsored and get some money in the club that way as well. It's just a bit of a something to help with. Um, we sort of built it with Jan actually is probably 90% responsible for it. Um, <laughs> that's a good thing. Um, so we were talking about before Christmas with Jan, uh, festivals and things like that where people go and charge and you're talking a few vehicles. So we wanted to make something that's very portable. And essentially, I was talking to Graham the other day when I took it over and he said, why don't you just put it on a trolley? So fair enough, we'll just put it on a trolley and you can roll it out and off you go. So the plan is to have it for you guys and then if there's any festivals going on, we can take it to the festival and plug it in. Um, of organised some of the gear for some faster charges as well, so there'll be probably a version two on the way sooner or later, with um, paid three-phase charges, like one on each side. Um, that'll take a socket, a J Type Two plug, um, and you can just have a Type Two to Type One or a Type Two Type Two, and plug it in off you go. Um, that's pretty much it. But yeah, if you guys are okay with me taking a picture, where. Uh, putting a proposal in for this place to do solar and probably two EV chargers out the front that'll be quite a bit faster. They'll be seven kilowatts, maybe higher. We'll see how we go, see how much power we can get. So, okay. no worries. but yeah. Uh, I actually, it's built. I've just got to put it on a trolley. And the plan is to bring it into the meeting, I would say next meeting. Um, yeah, so it is built. It's just making it a bit more 
sponsor friendly. So the idea is to have two posts, one on each side, and you can put flags, like sponsorship flags on either side, and then a sign that says AEVA club above it, make it a bit more friendly in that sort of business sense. Uh, but essentially it is put together and we are testing it at the moment. So yeah, it should be ready to go at the next meeting. All right. Thank you very much. So you right there, buddy? Go for it. Harold's keen for Mary to talk about our journey with getting a new battery in our iMIV not working for nine months. God. <laughs> <laughs> he knows more, more than me. Speak up loud. Oh, yeah, this is, this is not a mic, this is for the camera. Okay, some of you know us. We were involved quite a lot with the group here. And come March last year, uh, we were charging our little um, IMEV and we heard this bang and it wouldn't charge. And it didn't charge again until November last year. So there was quite a journey we had to go through. It was very traumatic. We found out we had to, re the, we took it to a group who was supposed to know how to look after Mitsubishi cars. And of course, Mitsubishi IMO um, is, you know, quite unique, I think. So we take it to Mitsubishi Nanda, who said, oh, yeah, yeah, we can fix this. So it was interesting to see that it took them so long. And part of that journey is because it's a Japanese import. We have um, parts aren't available here in Australia very easily. Uh, the network simply didn't work on that professional level. And admittedly, we could well have gone to Graham, which we used to talk to Graham on the side and say, Graham, what do you think about this? This is what they're saying. And he said, oh, well, maybe it's this, this or this. In the end, they told us it was the ECU, which is the electronic control unit or whatever. They said, that's a fuse is blown, that's simply gone, we're going to have to replace it. That's so many thousand dollars. I said, oh, okay, it won't go unless we replace it. Replace it. So then they replaced it, it still didn't work. So we asked them, well, maybe there's something else. So they looked at something else, oh, the MCU, whichever that is, I don't know. Another fuse had gone. Yeah, the motor control, yeah. It was gone, so, oh, we've got to replace that. So they replaced it. The next thing is, we said, well, since you've got it, because it's such an old car, so-called, 10 years old, having done about 102,000 um, kilometres, we'd get a new battery. They said, oh, that'll be easy. So they ordered the battery from Japan. It took six weeks. Mind you, by this time, it's about um, June, and we still hadn't got the car back. We actually thought about deregistering it and thought that would be a bad idea. We kept it registered. It's still in the garage, in a little corner, and they, they love talking about it, but different technicians came and went. They sort of worked there for a while, and then they left. So it was almost like this car was never gonna leave the shop. It was always gonna be there. Anyway, to cut a long story short, they bought um, a battery over from Japan. There was faulty, so they had to send it back. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, this happens. Anyway, Japan sent another one, but in the meantime, it wasn't a direct conversation between Brisbane and Japan. It was Brisbane, Adelaide, Adelaide, Japan, and it never came back direct to Brisbane. It always went Japan, Adelaide, and maybe many people in between, and then got back to the Brisbane technicians who then had to work through another set of codes. And because it was a new battery, and we're talking about a 2010 car, the codes were different, and they had to go back to Japan via Adelaide to find out what those codes meant. So that was another couple of months sitting in the garage waiting for the second battery to actually operate. Once they got all that connected, it still didn't work. And they said, okay, maybe it's the cable. Now, I would have thought they'd checked that cable long before, but anyway, the cable, they replaced it, went. It's all good. Battery. So we got it back right about the middle of November. So that is the start. The other thing that's happened since then, about a month ago, we got a letter saying, oh, there's a recall, a compulsory recall of all uh, Maev 2010. It's got a brake booster, the brake booster of some sort has to be replaced. 
we took it there and I said, Hugh, we mightn't see this car again. <laughs> but we did, it took them three hours, all done, and now it's going like a charm. <laughs> and now it's on the market for um, 15,000. So, um, all right, Francisco uh, did a quick video of this Pajero that he's done up driving around in, in where is this? Is this your house or oh, that's workshop or somewhere? Yeah. It's actually, I bought a, um, I bought a, uh, uh, rolling chassis because I couldn't actually do it online because I've got to take all the stuff off. So, so he bought a dummy car and he's put the yeah, stuff in that one. Sure that right. works, Let's go. go this is a bit disconcerting, this video, when it gets towards the end. Should there be sound? No, I don't think there right. should be sound. <laughs> Hold on, there's no pedestrian noise. Well, there's a wire hanging out. Not with the window like that. It's got a big hole in the windscreen. It's air conditioning. That's it. Look at that. <laughs> That's ridiculous. The, the guy basically says, oh, somebody stole the engine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we should just do that. Drive around town. And say, All right. Um, so we've just got uh, one last thing to cover off, and Graham is going to start um, a little bit of a series of um, discussions each meeting, just about for those people that are still interested in converting um, electric cars from ice to electric. Um, he's going to have a chat to us tonight about s what car to select. Is that right? Is that right? We're starting with that. So, come on, Graham. Oh, crap. Do you want to use this? No. I'll talk really loud. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. yeah cool. All right. So, for those who don't know me, um, going back, uh, I don't know, 2008 or something like that, was we uh, had this idea we're going to build an electric car for ourselves because we, we'd, we'd heard of other people doing it and, and so on. So it started off just as a, a personal thing, just to make a car, make it go, so on. And uh, so one car led to another car, led to a third car. And I'm happy to say all three of those cars are still driven every day from 2010 on sort of thing, you know. Anyway, so um, over the years I've helped people with uh, components, either all the components or part of the components, maybe a battery set or something like that. Um, more than happy to help people out. Um, there's probably a few faces around here. I've helped them out with bits and pieces along the way. <clears throat> um, happy to give guidance and all that sort of thing. So this is my like a car business. It's not actually what I make. I don't make any money out of this, <laughs> but my real business is a mechanical workshop and spare parts. <clears throat> um, this is sort of like a hobby that might make a few dollars. Um, the, probably the, start, the place to start when you're talking about conversions is why would you want to do one? I can go out and I can buy a second hand Nissan Leaf or whatever. Oh, just quickly, Mary, I've got a Nissan Leaf in my workshop and it's got a faulty charger, we found out, all right? So, the, the thing was with the codes, it was all code normal. I've got the charger out, sitting on a workbench and we can drive the car around. It thinks there's nothing wrong, it just won't charge. So this is a trap for people with repairing electric vehicles, is um, you can plug your little scan tool in, you can talk to it all you like. It may not give you the what you're looking for. And, and it would appear to me from what your experience is that the, over, the oversight was, we don't care what the charger does, we're only interested in the car. You know, so I don't know what the newer cars are like. I've got a Tesla X I'm wrecking at the workshop. I'll do a little bit of research into that and see if that comes up with any error codes. I think it would. But anyway, sorry, I digress. So why do we want electric cars? So that was a question I asked a lot of people at the car shows. You know, you've got to examine the reasoning for getting it. You know, is it, I want to save money. Um, 
I want to, uh, for me personally, it was because my wife Gail is a bad asthmatic and, and diesel fumes is what creates asthma. It's really a health thing, um, an environmental thing, try to lead the way. I'd hate paying for petrol. <laughs> it's terrible. Um, so that was my reasoning. Other people might say, well, I want something different. Um, some people might say, I've got a classic and it's difficult to repair. So some of the older classic cars um, helped a guy with a Model T Ford. It, it's almost impossible to find parts. He had a completely rusted petrol engine, couldn't do anything with it. He was happy enough that we supplied an electric motor and helped him get it driving on electric. I mean, the video footage of him driving around the paddocks out northwest New South Wales, giggling his head off and he's like 80, you know? So he, he, he loved it. Um, the Combis, the Volkswagen Beetles, they're a popular choice. Um, when you think about um, as an investment, um, you wouldn't take a GT Falcon and convert that. That would be stupid. Um, there are certain cars that just wouldn't bastardise by putting an electric car uh, motor in. Um, Tim did the 64 Cortina. Perfect vehicle for that sort of thing. Semi-classic. I think he's value added to it. I think it's actually worth more now as an electric conversion than maybe what it would have been if it was uh, original. It's not a GT Cortina, is it? No, it's just a standard. So, so we got what I would call the semi-classic. That seems to be where most of my clients are going nowadays. Um, they're heading towards this idea that I've got this car. It might be whatever, and I've had Jensen interceptors and and all sorts of crazy cars put to me. A bug eye Sprite was a good one, I think, to become an electric car because they're just a crap motor, the petrol one, they're just totally no good. So by uh, value adding to a vehicle, that's one way to go forward. Um, other people are looking for certain vehicles for certain reasons. So the first thing before we start a conversion is examine the reason why do I want to do it? Is it because it's a men in sheds thing? I, I want to build something. And that's great, there's a lot of people who want to build stuff. Um, is it that I want to save this classic car? Is it that I just want a little computer like, computer like uh, Kevin and I and Simone drive little Swifts? They're worth bugger all, really. Um, but we've been driving for years and, gee, we've saved a heap of petrol and we quite, really quite enjoy driving them. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is to think about the, the way that the arrangement is. And, and I'm, I'm really for one for keeping it simple. Um, if you can keep it simple, it's a simple build, it's easy to see, it's easy to diagnose if something goes wrong. A uh, good example is if you have something that's very complex and you don't know how everything works um, and it's all interacting with each other, if there's a fault, as there is with the IMEV, and it took people way smarter than me months to figure that out, all right? And the funny thing is it was simply a lead at was probably the first thing you should have checked. Anyway, and that happens so often. But anyway, so if you make a car too complicated, you're not, fr this fella here, he can sit down and design the entire PC board and make it all himself. That's great. But that's no, that's no good to me, because I would, I'd have to come back to you to get it fixed. So, so certain people like complex, and certain people like simple. I'm simple. So a motor, controller, keep the whole thing simple. So the type of drive line, you can have a front wheel drive if you want, um, you can have a rear wheel drive, it's basically you make an adapter plate and you hook the motor up to it and a connecting shaft. And so then you've got your next question. Do you want regen braking? Do you want uh, gears? Do you want to use a clutch? Do you want to direct, go direct drive? Okay, so I'll quickly touch on that. So with, with the different types of drive lines, there's different pros and cons. Um, if your target is to uh, generate as much regen braking as you can, um, you really probably should go for a clutch. Uh, the reason for that is that then it'll drive like it did with the petrol motor without the noise. So you, with a re full regen braking, you take your set foot off the accelerator, and that means it's like engine braking, the car starts to slow down. As it's slowing down, that energy is going back into the battery, so it extends your range. Um, the reason for a clutch is, well, you're slowing down, touching the brake, you're going around a corner. Um, you know, like if you want to change down a gear, well, you need a clutch because if you try to change gear while regen is happening, the gears are going to crunch. That's if you're not using a clutch. Because clutchless is something we do as well. Sometimes we'll just hook that motor straight up without a clutch and um, we just won't have regen. And while it sounds unbelievable, to change gears, you just take your full-off accelerator, change gears. The synchro mesh in any gearbox will pick up 
the um, pick up the pick up the next gear and off you go. And that's exactly how we've been driving these Swifts for even a day. Um, the downside of that is you can't have regen. So if you don't have a big range, get rid of the clutch. Let's keep it simple. Just have a direct drive to the gearbox. That gearbox allows you to use a smaller motor or get more get up and go out of a big motor. Um, Tim's is a good example. He's got a fairly high performance motor. He uses a gearbox, and the acceleration should be quite quite startling, I would imagine. The motor he's using that little Cortina I've just used in a, in a uh, long wheelbase transit van that had a two and a half litre turbo diesel. I think it actually goes better with that motor than it did with the diesel. So it was quite quite surprising how much an electric motor will shift. So that car, of course, we use the clutch in it because we want to be able to use downshifting gears going around corners and get as much regen as we can back. Because it's a big truck, it's going to use a lot of energy. Um, so you have a got, you've got a few things to consider before you even start doing a car. How you want to set it up. Do you care about regen? Some don't, that's fine. Um, some do because they want to get as much range as they can out of a vehicle. Um, there is a third option, that's go direct drive, forget about gearbox, forget about everything. The advantage with that is that you can have full regen braking straight off the accelerator pedal. And if anyone's driven a Nissan Leaf, for example, you could pretty much drive the car wherever you want and hardly ever touch the brake. Go halfway is neutral, take your foot off and it starts to slow down. I think a lot of the, uh, uh, is the i3s like that as well? I think most of them are. And so they don't actually have a gearbox as such, it just goes straight to the rear tail shaft or, or whatever. Um, and it's direct drive, nothing. I did a car for Magnetic Island, a little Daihatsu thing without a roof on it, like a, a convertible. And um, what, we've, what they found is the speed limit on the island was uh, 70 kilometres an hour or something like that. They found if they just left it in third gear and threw the gear lever away, that was it, that was the car. So it was simple, just direct drive. Even though they used a clutch, they just left it in and off they went in one gear the whole day. So you can do that as well. The downside is you need to use a bigger motor because you need a lot more torque. The upside of doing that is that because you use a bigger motor, you need a bigger controller and you need a bit of battery pack, so you get a better range. So there's a whole bunch of things to think about. And this is keeping it simple. So when you're talking about doing a conversion, that's the first few things you gotta think about. Why are you doing it? Pick the sort of car you wanna use. Um, think about it long because you're going to have that car for maybe 15, 20 years. Trust me, you will fall in love with it. Every time I drive past the service station, I've got the huge <laughs> grin on my face. That's why I love this car, and I'll do anything I can to keep this car going because it's just such a fabulous thing. And it's really, let's face it, it's just really an old shitbox with an electric motor in it, okay? So, um, the, uh, and do it because you love to do it. If you're looking at it, say, oh, I'm going to get a cheaper Tesla, you're not because trust me, no home built a patch on a Tesla. Um, but then price-wise, they're not a patch either. You know? So have a think about that. Um, and uh, when you start, there's, uh, you really need to be a member of this club because there's people like this bloke and uh, there's a whole bunch of faces. There's a lot of uh, smarts in this one room. And I, and I do go to some of these guys myself and say, hey, can you give me a hand with such and such because I can't fathom out. So. We're not an island, we all work together and help each other out. I'll, um, I'll leave it at that. Um, if anyone wants to talk about conversions, I'm happy to talk about them. Um, but like I say, think long and hard before you start. It's, it's the old measure three times, cut once. This is what you're doing. You want to start this project, you want to have a clear chart of where you're going and have a clear idea of what you're doing. Um, if you do, it, it can be very simple. Um, and as time goes by, batteries are getting lighter. Um, the, the sort of gear we're bringing in now, um, we're getting custom made um, uh, wiring looms. So uh, to wire a car used to take three or four days. Now it's about three or four hours because you just got to pull the loom through the car and plug it in. You know, So things are getting much easier for the home builder. Um, and um, uh, yeah, and just uh, have a good think about where you want to be. Don't think about it short term. For God's sake, don't think you're going to do it and sell it and make a profit. That'll never happen. Trust me. All right. Um, but yeah, do it because you love to do it. Don't do it for any other reason. I think is probably my parting message. Um, in a couple of months, I'll probably have a talk about start talking about the electronics and do, do a quick half hour because people fall asleep if I talk for an hour. 
but I'll have a half hour chat every now and then on certain components along the way. Um, not in depth, but just an overview. So people got an idea when I talk to you about hmm, amps and, and, and current or control or outputs and stuff like that. Um, it wouldn't take long to explain it to you, but then you at least understand what we're all talking about. And I think that's part of the trouble here when somebody gets up in and they start talking about like the battery over here. Uh, I'm sure there's probably 20 people here don't know what he's talking about. We'd love to explain it to you so you know. Yep, he's one. <laughs> All right, okay, so I'll leave a go at that. All, All right. right, thank you very Graham, much. Graham, a round of applause. All right, thank you very much, guys. Uh, it's time for tea and coffee and biscuits. So, unless anyone else has anything else. I don't want them to say. We really want some people for the EV Gimpy thing. The EV Gimpy um, thing. You know, the, the event that's at Gimpy, the UK show, they really would like to see a bunch of cars and the climate. Okay, and what's the date? It was up on your thing. It was up there, the 4th of the 4th. February something, yeah, that's right. The 4th of the 4th. Yeah. Okay. We'll just send that out to I'll, I'll send reminders out to everyone uh, about that and we might even um, get a bunch of us to drive up. There's plenty of charges on the way and stuff like that, so um, look out for that one. All right, thanks very much, guys. It's time to uh, chat.